Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much in particular for welcoming me back to uh, Ljubljana, uh, which I, as I can see, is a cradle, a crucible for radical intellectuals. And I hope it will uh, continue uh, like this, uh, providing uh, many of us in London with interesting uh, as uh, intellectuals. Uh, let me start off by saying that I had a number of ideas for this uh, lecture. Let me start off with the uh, maybe the most ambitious one, which was that ideally what I would like to talk to you about is uh, the view of Marx on the monetary business cycle. Uh, if you, uh, this is a very important issue because if you go back to Marx's earliest draft, uh, the Grundrisse, the earliest draft of a systematic work on political economy, which is the Grundrisse, uh, you find that in the Grundrisse, uh, Marx rejected the notion of a monetary business cycle. He rejected the notion that the disturbances uh, of capitalism are, are a monetary phenomenon. They're caused by problems within the monetary system or aspects or features of the monetary system. And uh, he, for those that have read the Grundrisse, you'll know this consists of, uh, of just two very, very long chapters. There's a very, very long and very interesting, methodologically interesting introduction, the very long chapter on, um, actually the introduction has some very interesting remarks on art as well, which are worth reading. Uh, but he then, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, one third of the book is a chapter on money, which is the rejection of the monetary business cycle. And then the second chapter is extremely long, and it's on capital. It's arguing that capital is not uh, a, 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 an economic uh, category uh, or, a, or a, a category of wealth, but actually it's a social uh, phenomenon. So he, he rejected the business cycle there and then got down to, uh, then there was another, uh, what was it, the critique of political economy, and then when he got around to writing Capital, uh, he sketched out uh, uh, the Capital in, of course, in reverse order, Theories of Surplus Value, first volume three, uh, volume two and volume one. And what you find is, what you found was that in volume three, uh, Marx brought back the monetary business cycle in a different and an unusual form uh, as uh, interest-bearing capital. And what I, what I would have liked to have done would have been to link uh, this up with what is happening in finance today and finan finance capital uh, today. I don't have the time, but I just want to highlight a particular uh, a relevant feature of Marx's discussion of this, and that is this rejection of the monetary business cycle, the rejection of the view that the, uh, uh, the, the, the cycle, the business cycle uh, in, uh, in capitalism is a monetary phenomenon, in other words, caused by features of the monetary system or the credit system. Uh, this, I think, is, is lies at the root of many of the uh, 
misunderstandings by many uh, Marxists of what is happening in uh, uh, within the uh, within the eurozone at the moment. Not to mention, actually, it's the it's, it lies at the root of uh, the uh, the mistakes, the errors of, of non-Marxists as well. And I'll, and I'll explain this a little bit further later on. Secondly, uh, as a second preliminary, let me um, make some reference to the uh, Research in Money and Finance report on the, 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 the two reports on the Eurozone. <laughs> I feel a certain responsibility for this because when research in money and finance was set up, it was set up in, in, in SOAS as a way of bringing together uh, critical researchers in, uh, uh, who are working on um, mon monetary and financial economics, doing research on monetary and financial economics. Uh, and so I, uh, I was involved, I was included in some early discussions. But when we started discussing the Eurozone crisis, it, be it became... It, <laughs> when we, it, it became very apparent that the, uh, uh, there was a particular line, there was a particular political line uh, which was being put forward, which had nothing to do with um, either a Marxian approach uh, or, a, uh, or a serious understanding of the monetary and economic issues uh, at stake in the Eurozone. In other words, you, uh, the, the reports uh, highlighted problems in the Eurozone, but then without uh, without deeper theoretical investigation, moved on to particular solutions, in particular the, 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 the solution of exit, uh, without uh, uh, considering either the class position or the, uh, uh, the view uh, the, the, uh, a deeper understanding of the actual credit relations within the Eurozone. Uh, and I'll, I will discuss these further in, my pa uh, in the paper that follows. So I ended up with uh, a title of Resolving the Crisis in the Eurozone uh, with an, uh, an offer to, uh, to this group to explain uh, the different solutions that have been offered uh, for the crisis and why uh, they wouldn't work and then to put forward uh, a particular solution which I think uh, would work and uh, uh, or may work but which also has some uh, important political uh, and economic implications. Okay, resolving the crisis in the Eurozone. If you're going to talk about the crisis in the Eurozone, you have to identify it for what it is. It's very uh, easy to identify in terms of decreasing growth rates. It's very easy to identify it in terms of the mess in the government bond market uh, that's been created uh, by the Maastricht criteria. Uh, it's very easy to identify it in terms uh, of pressure on wages and particular pressure on the working class through unemployment through the threat of unemployment and to say that uh, in some way this is the, uh, this is the crisis. I want to I highlight a particular feature of the crisis which uh, it seems to me is um, the, 
the key um, element which uh, creates the crisis and is making it worse uh, in the form of a dynamic process. And this is the process of deflation. Deflation in an economy that no longer uses uh, a form of commodity money or even any money which is con uh, uh, money which is convertible, a fiat money which is convertible into some other commodity at a fixed rate, but simply uses credit. In a credit economy, uh, the counterpart of credit is debt, <laughs> someone else's debt. And why deflation is a very bad thing, it's a very serious uh, problem in this situation, is that if you deflate, if prices are falling, then, or wages are falling, then because debt is fixed in money terms, uh, what happens is that the real value or the wage good value or the labor value of that debt increases as wages fall. And this it's, it is very, it's very important uh, to remember uh, when, you, when you consider some of the basic um, solutions to the crisis in the Eurozone. The uh, essential ones that have been, uh, uh, well, let me, let me just say something about the theory at the background of the, the uh, or the, that underlay the arrangements within the Eurozone. The theory uh, behind it is the notion that monetary policy regulates the business cycle, so the, the, the view that Marx had rejected and in particular uh, there is the theory that uh, the business cycle is determined by wages or in an international context by the exchange rate. So the proponents of the, when they were setting up the Eurozone um, the the view was that in a normal capitalist economy, you have uh, two systems, two ways of adjusting for trade imbalances. If a country has a trade deficit, then you can lower wages, and this will make products more competitive, and if you make the products more competitive, you will uh, you gain competitive advantage. You can expand your exports and, in this way, balance your trade. However, it was well known already, uh, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, that lowering people's wages uh, is a very troublesome uh, and sometimes even a bloody business. Uh, workers will naturally resist uh, uh, having their wages lowered. So in, in the 1920s, the view uh, came to be, uh, was, was put forward, in particular by Keynes in his tract on monetary reform, that the alternative to wage uh, decreases is simply to have an exchange rate which could be adjustable downwards. You make your exports more competitive by depreciating your currency. So, in the, within, when the Eurozone was set up, uh, the, uh, there was great attention paid to the idea that, uh, or, or a sort of founding principle uh, uh, of the Eurozone, the monetary union, was the idea that um, wage flexibility is a substitute for
for exchange rate flexibility. So that if you went into a monetary union, you were abandoning exchange rate flexibility, so you had to have wage flexibility. What, uh, at that time, when the economists, the founding fathers of the European Monetary Union uh, saw when they looked around Europe, they saw one economy whose wage system was totally inflexible, and that was the German wage system. Uh, the German wages are centrally determined. Uh, they, uh, uh, so the, the, there was a, it, it was a big fuss made about this, and in the, in the Schroeder government, the Schroeder governments talked to the unions, it was an SDP government allied with the trade unions, and they agreed that uh, they would uh, lower their wages in exchange for <laughs> not having any redundancies, no one, being, uh, no one losing their jobs. So this was the limit of the kind of wage flexibility. But the essential view was that wage flexibility is interchangeable with exchange rate flexibility. And if I have a criticism of the RMF line of exit and uh, a change, a exit from the Eurozone and depreciation, uh, it is that it buys this line of uh, the wage rate uh, of internal devaluation uh, as being the substitute for um, uh, for exchange rate flexibility. Uh, the, the friends of mine who wrote the RMF report are quite clearly unsympathetic to the idea of wage reductions, so instead they propose exit uh, return to the cu uh, currency and a, uh, a return to a, a domestic currency and the depreciation of that currency. Now I won't go into the financial consequences uh, of uh, exiting in a system where you have financial integration. Actually one of the earlier, in an earlier draft of this presentation, I was going to call it Banking Integration and the Politics of European Disintegration. Because if you have a process of banking integration and uh, you're, um, you exit, uh, if, if the banks are integrated within Europe and you exit from the Eurozone, uh, effectively your banking system, the banking system of the country, uh, of both the country the, the exits and the countries outside, uh, the, the banks become insolvent. Uh, the uh, banks, for example, in the case of Greece, were Greece to withdraw, uh, its banks would become insolvent because they would still retain euro liabilities, particularly in very large sums, uh, something like 80% um, of Greek GDP, which has been borrowed from the ECB. Uh, would be uh, 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 would still be in euros, but uh, the, the 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 rest of the this would be a liability for the Greek banks, but their assets would be in now converted into drachma, and those drachma would be correspondingly worth much less if you had a dramatic um, depreciation. Okay, you could. Uh, you could nationalise the, 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 the Greek banking uh, system um, to somehow try and keep the, 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 the banks going. Yes, you could do this, but in effect it would mean that uh, the government takes on the euro liabilities of the Greek banks. So in addition to its own euro liabilities, it actually makes uh, the, 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 the Greek government's situation worse. Uh, so I'm, this, as I say, this, this is a credit problem. Let me look at the real problem. The real problem is that to make this kind of a strategy work, uh, you would 
it, you would actually need to squeeze real wages uh, because in, uh, in Greece something like 40% of GDP is imported uh, and a very high proportion of Greek wage goods are imported. Uh, if you, uh, as you depreciate that currency, uh, you would uh, in, in fact be uh, the, 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 the domestic, co the costs in, in Greece of imported goods would rise. What you would then have to do, what a left, left wing government would have to do is hold wages, hold nominal wages at their at the rate, uh, at the level at which they've been converted into uh, the, the, the new drachmas. Uh, why would you need to hold this? You would need to hold this to get the competitive advantage. In other words, your competitive advantage would arise from falling real wages. And then you, and what falling real wages do is they reduce the domestic market. Uh, and then you have this, you have this trade-off. You, you, you have a falling domestic market, uh, which, is, which will of course cause higher unemployment. Uh, you hope to be able to recoup some of that lost production and lost demand from the foreign, from the export market. Uh, but any gain in competitiveness, as I say, would be offset, or probably more than offset, by the loss of the domestic market. So this, it seems to me, is not a solution. It is still caught in this uh, fundamental theoretical uh, um, uh, di a dichotomy or a dilemma in which you treat the wage rate as a substitute, or wage flexibility as a substitute for exchange rate flexibility in obtaining uh, what, you know, what you call competitiveness. Um, actually, in, in a country like Greece, what it would do is it would, uh, your banking system would probably collapse uh, the economy would euroize very, very effectively. Possibly, I don't know whether this happened in uh, in Slovenia, but certainly in in the rest of Eastern Europe, as communism collapsed, uh, economies very quickly dollarized. You made all your contracts in dollars um, because that was a fixed value. The domestic currency was uh, um, uh, was losing its value due to hyperinflation. Uh, uh, and so on, very, very, very high inflation. And I think that that's, this is what, what would happen to a currency that, uh, to any country that exited uh, from the Euro. You would, uh, uh, and in the process of uh, Euroization, you've in effect lost all the benefits of uh, having a credit system. Uh, the benefits being that, that you have um, your, uh, you have a flexible uh, system of finance uh, and money. Uh, it would actually embed the euro even more strongly uh, in, in a country, uh, country that's leaving. My, my friend Joseph Halevi has pointed out to me that there's one country which, in which this probably doesn't apply, and this is Italy, because Italy is a very large market uh, in which they, uh, in which if you, if it exited from the Eurozone, you could probably um, uh, reflate the, econ the, the, the economy domestically um, and go back to, uh, in Joseph Halevi's view, the, the system of the 1980s and the 1990s where the, the, that economy had high inflation but kept depreciating its currency to retain competitiveness. I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, Italy uh, still imports uh, a very high proportion of its GDP and in particular it's very vulnerable uh, in energy. Uh, and
I, as I say, I think this uh, this argument about uh, exit or internal deflation, exit versus internal uh, devaluation, uh, is uh, is a wrong approach. It's this approach that regards the wage rate as a substitute for exchange rate uh, flexibility. Let me look at uh, some of the other solutions that have been put forward. Uh, the, uh, one of the ones that has been, uh, one of the financial innovations that has occurred is the setting up of various funds to refinance, to provide new funds for member governments of the Eurozone. Uh, this, it seems to me, is a, um, it's a marginal uh, uh, contribution to the discussion. It, it, it actually, or to, to the policy debate, it doesn't provide a solution. Uh, it relieves symptoms of the deflation. The symptom of the deflation being the inability of the government to sell its bonds. Uh, so you, find, you set up a fund which will buy some government bonds. Uh, that solves the problem today. It doesn't solve the problem tomorrow. And more importantly, it doesn't solve uh, the internal problem, which is the, the one increasingly of prices and wages falling in relation to the value of debt. And what this is doing to squeeze expenditure uh, in the economy. Um, a, in particular, what it doesn't do is it doesn't tackle the, the essential problem of reflating the economy. How, how can you uh, get the, uh, uh, the, the, the economies of the Eurozone inflating again, uh, 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 growing again? And in fact, uh, growing at a rate that's it's, it's growing faster than the um, uh, than the rise in debt, uh, or the rise in government debt. Um, so that's uh, uh, th th this is uh, this kind of government refinancing. As I say, I don't I don't think it uh, works. I think this applies to the uh, Varoufakis and uh, uh, and Holland proposal. Stuart Holland. Uh, a, a, is a very, uh, very nice, very thoughtful person, and I think he he rightly recognises that the real underlying problem is the un, uh, the reluctance of capitalist enterprises to uh, engage in fixed capital investment, to engage in capital accumulation, and he believes that. The European Investment Bank can, to some extent, replace this. Well, it can and it should, but it, this doesn't deal with the uh, with the underlying macroeconomic problem. Uh, let me uh, mention, therefore, let me move on to the second um, solution, which is uh, monetarist inflation. Uh, money, uh, in other words, trying to inflate the money supply. Uh, the monetarists uh, who uh, were very, back in the 1970s and 1980s when I was learning economics, uh, a very influential group who believed that the uh, the the the, the the business cycle, the capitalist business cycle, uh, was determined by the money supply. Uh, these are, I guess, these these are probably the, uh, uh, the, the the type of this is the these are the believers of the monetary business cycle that uh, Marx was so keen to reject. In Contemporary times, in our, in our times, uh, the monetarists 
have emerged as the proponents of quantitative easing. Uh, where in, in, in the modern economy, we, since we don't operate in a, in a credit economy, uh, money is created uh, by the central bank buying financial assets or by, by, by securities. So quantitative easing is a system by which the central bank buys large amounts of bonds and in this way it makes banks more liquid. It puts, uh, it, because it buys the bonds from the, uh, from the public or from the banks and in exchange it gives the banks uh, the uh, reserves uh, which are on the bank's account in the uh, in the central bank. If, it, if for example, if if we all had government bonds and they were bought by the central bank, we sold them to the central bank. Uh, the, when the payments were cleared, we would get a uh, a credit in our account, uh, but our bank would get. Uh, the equivalent of that credit would be a reserve amount which the central bank would have credited to, to the account of our bank. So quantitative easing is a way of giving uh, banks reserves. It's not printing money, it's, uh, it, it's giving uh, banks more money. And it makes banks more liquid. The problem is that it doesn't make the economy more liquid. It doesn't make firms, non-financial firms, more liquid. Uh, it doesn't make uh, you, you or I, more more liquid. As I said, if it bought the if it bought the bonds for uh, from us, we would have a sum of money. But the the actual amount number of people who own government bonds or, or any bonds at all who own them directly is very very few. Um, it's because it's less than five percent in, uh, in in the U.S. Um, most people, if they have financial assets, it's through their insurance company or the pension fund. So, you know, we, we don't get any benefit, which would you know we might have pension funds or insurance policies, but we don't get any benefit from this. Uh, why is this? Uh, uh, why doesn't this work? Well, it doesn't. Uh, uh, so it doesn't work because. It doesn't put money into the um, uh, into firms or company uh, or or, in, or into households, uh, particularly into firms. This is crucial because uh, it is firms who are uh, who need who would use the money for um, uh, uh, for investment. If they were sufficiently liquid, we might use the money. <coughs> if they were sufficiently liquid, why? <coughs> question is why. Oh, well, I'll come on to this uh, later on. The uh, if you want an example of how monetarism doesn't work, you look at Japan. Japan for the past 20 years has been in a, uh, in a condition of deflation. In 2001, uh, they started a strategy. There are, uh, the, the monetarists were recommending all sorts of um, possibilities of how to st stimulate the economy um, they were giving, uh, they gave people tax rebates uh, in the hope that they would go out and spend the money. In the uh, uh, Milton Friedman recommended that uh, the central bank go up in a helicopter and throw money out. Uh, the, I, this, is, uh, this is the delusion of fiat money that somehow you know, the amount of paper money in circulation will uh, cause, in, uh, 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 cause inflation. The, the amount of paper money in circulation is uh, actually as much 
paper money as people have income. You know, if you if you have uh, your income goes into your bank and you can take out as much uh, paper money against that as you want to. It's not the amount of paper money that is the constraint. It's the income. You know, for most of us, it's the income that uh, that is the constraint on our expenditure, not the the paper money into which we can convert that income. Uh, so the, the Japanese in, in 2001 embarked on, on this strategy and it had no effect at all. No effect at all. Around 2006, uh, 2005, 2006, uh, people said that they detected signs of economic recovery in Japan. Uh, and Japan is interesting because there it was, 20 years of deflation in between Japan, China growing at a rate of 10% a year and the United States also growing fairly rapidly, importing massively and Japan doesn't grow. It's main markets. There was something wrong with that, uh, with that capitalist system. Uh, okay, the next, so monetarism doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work. Let me move on to uh, the uh, position advocated by uh, many Keynesians. Keynesian fiscal stimulus or fiscal federalism. Uh, this is the, the, the position uh, that has been uh, advocated by many people on the left and if you want evidence of its success you look at the United States. Uh, Obama has, uh, has spent massively exceeding the, the, the constitutional limits on uh, spending and has managed to achieve a two and a half percent rate of growth. Is 2.5% enough? No, it's not enough. It's not enough, bearing in mind uh, labour productivity, the growth of labour productivity, it's not enough to mop up uh, mass unemployment. In particular, uh, Keynesian uh, fiscal stimulus doesn't work in an indebted economy. Because in an indebted economy, if you have more, if you have more income, or if you have uh, additional uh, resources, uh, Keynesian fiscal stimulus puts money directly into the economy. What do people do in an indebted economy? They repay their debts. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it does well. So, okay, you could you could lower the rate of interest down nearly to zero, and in this way try to persuade them that they shouldn't repay their debts, but they will still repay their debts. Why? For a very simple reason: that uh, your credit rating, whether you're a householder which want, uh, who wants to borrow money, or a um, is, or a firm which wants to issue a bond, your credit rating depends on the amount of debt you have outstanding. If you can, uh, uh, if you can repay debt, uh, you can uh, uh, you can then borrow more money. Something else has happened in Europe to. Uh, how can I put it, constipate the financial system to, 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 to block up the financial system and that is the condition of the banks. The usual way in which companies or large companies would um, refinance themselves to get into a stronger financial <coughs> position if they have debt it would be to issue equity or shares. This is, equity or shares is a very safe form of financing. 
in the first place, you never have to pay it back. In the second place, any dividends that you, that you pay are discretionary. However, being able to issue new shares depends on there being a buyer for the new shares. And there, to start with, there are not many buyers because the usual buyers would be pension funds and insurance companies. The pension funds and insurance companies are already in, in difficulty with their financial assets. They already have seen their, uh, their share portfolios reduce in value. They're not going to buy more shares. Not just this, but everyone knows, everyone has known since 2007 that uh, the, the people who will be coming into the equity market to issue new equity are the banks. The standard uh, argument for uh, 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 making the banks stronger uh, that, that's accepted uh, by the main, in the mainstream is that uh, the bank should issue more capital, should have more capital, and then that's supposed to make it, it, it stronger. And in some cases, banks are being forced to do this. And if they're forced to do this, it means that they're willing to pay uh, uh, any uh, yield, offer any dividend, very, very high dividends for uh, um, uh, in, in order to sell new issues, new, new capital issues. That's a problem for industrial companies because it means that if they want to raise finance, they have to issue debt. They cannot issue um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, they cannot issue equity. If you want uh, examples of this, uh, there, there's there's a very fine uh, 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 there were a couple of very very interesting reports in the Economist in the summer of 2008, uh, which described how some of the major multinational companies had got themselves heavily into debt in building up um, they had actually borrowed money not for investment necessarily but for, for merger and takeover activity they wanted to refinance this in the equity market and suddenly found themselves excluded from the equity market by the banks which were coming in and hoovering up all the capital that there was uh, the response of those companies was very simple. What every company does faced with excessive debt, uh, or what every capitalist firm does, you don't cut back on current production because your current production at least gives you some revenue. You cut back on investment. Uh, and, and this is why for those, those economists that, uh, uh, you, you know, these days, everyone, every Marxist, of course, reads the financial, at least in England. Uh, every one of my colleagues at SOAS, and particularly the people from RMF, read the Financial Times. Uh, if, you, uh, if you read the, the Financial Times, the financial crisis started uh, on the 25th of September 2008, the day Lehman Brothers collapsed. That's rubbish. The financial crisis started in the summer of 2008 when the big major multinational companies started postponing their investment projects. Uh, and as they postponed their investment projects, this then uh, reduces, slows down the pace of capital accumulation and puts the whole capital system into crisis. Um, what uh, for companies in that situation any Keynesian stimulus is simply used to repay debt uh, you can use infrastructure uh, investments we have them in Britain there were plenty of infrastructure investments in the uh, in the US for example in the, in the 1930s um, 
for an understanding of what happened in the 1930s uh, in America, I would recommend to you a, a very interesting essay by Paul Sweezy, which he wrote in 1941. Uh, it's simply called The Decline of the Investment Banker. Uh, quite a, a very informative article because Sweezy's father was a director of Citibank. Sweezy knew about finance. And what's interesting is that he, he puts forward the view uh, that the, the most important uh, f uh, uh, reform of the uh, Roosevelt administration uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1930s was not so much what well, it was um, uh, the, the, the new day, the, the new deal public sector projects trying to stop the falling wages uh, 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 and so on supportive mm -hmm. legislation for, for for unions but the other one was he argues it in that article that they the government the state took over from finance the role of finance capital the role of finance capital as coordinating uh, capital accumulation because in effect what the government did was it started organizing mergers and acquisitions new capital issues and so on the government took over that function uh, effectively this in in, uh, in Sweezy's view this was part of the process towards the socialization of capital Okay, so that's, uh, uh, these are the main, I think the major uh, solutions that have been propounded for, uh, for the crisis. Um, I'll just uh, maybe spend the last 10, 15 minutes explaining what I think uh, would be uh, a way out of the crisis. Uh, and this is uh, some of this has already appeared in an Italian journal, Critica Marxista, albeit, as, as you will see, it contains a lot of uh, the, the kind of financial operations that, are, um, as a former banker, I, I tend to have a better feel for, I feel more comfortable uh, analysing. First of all, uh, the way out of the crisis is more effective operations in government debt markets. Uh, this, uh, in many respects, the crisis over government debt in Europe is a self-inflicted uh, problem. It's a self-inflicted problem partly because it was inflicted by the, the Maastricht Treaty which uh, set up as a target for the financial markets these limits on government debt and, and fiscal deficit. Uh, these they, uh, 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 this was uh, completely unnecessary and undermines the operations uh, 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 of, uh, of government debt. In particular, the trade, the ensuring a uh, liquid market in government debt which in the past was a, um, uh, 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 it, it was a, a vital part of the, opera, of the activities of central banks. Um, the, uh, the bank, uh, if you go back to the uh, 17th century, the end of the 17th century, um, the, the, the Bank of England, for example, was set up to manage the government debt. It was, it was set up in the middle of a, of a frenzied speculative boom in the London Stock Exchange when the Bank of England uh, issued uh, shares. The money raised from those shares uh, was invested in government bonds. And uh, as, a uh, as a result of which, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the Bank of England was given a privileged position in trading 
in uh, government bonds. What was the purpose of this? Uh, the purpose of it was to uh, create a liquid market in government bonds. It taken even the oldest central bank is the bank of uh, is the is the Swedish central bank. The Swedish uh, the Riksbank, the, the Swedish Central Bank was set up actually as a result of a fraudulent operation which collapsed. Uh, and when it collapsed, it was what we would nowadays call too big to fail. So uh, it, it, it was taken over by the government and used as a bank to manage uh, government debt. Let me give you an example of how uh, uh, the obvious example of how the, the central bank can operate is simply by buying uh, government debt or buying and selling uh, government debt. It's not even, it's not even just necessarily, uh, it can even do more sophisticated uh, operations. Let me give you an example. There's an operation that central bank is called the twist. Uh, what the twist consists of is that you issue very short term securities. Uh, uh, at, uh, at the short-term rate of interest, and you use the money from that to buy long-term securities. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in, a, in a situation uh, as at the moment where uh, government bonds have very low prices in the secondary market, if you tried to buy government bonds from the banks at the present low prices, they wouldn't sell them. They wouldn't sell them for the simple reason that those, uh, uh, to sell them, they would have to write in a loss from having bought them at 100 euros uh, and now selling them at 50 euros or whatever is the price. They wouldn't sell them. So if you went into the market selling, trying to buy in at the current market price, you banks would sell and you would pretty quickly raise the price. Um, so this is one operation that you can do. It's a very simple one. The Federal Reserve did it in November, very successfully. They raised the, the yield on, on long-term government bonds. They don't do this in the Eurozone. Why? Because they're obsessed with a view of money in which Fiscal deficit causes inflation, and uh, the central bank must have nothing to do with it. Uh, okay, they will come round to this as they come round to a lot of things. They have already come round to the view that if they won't uh, lend money directly to governments, they will lend money to banks, which the banks then lend to governments. So you, th there is some. Uh, 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 it, it, there is some in policy innovation taking place. The second um, feature is more imaginative fiscal policy. Uh, this is a, a, something which actually the left ha, has not been uh, discussing very much, in particular the, the problem of the middle class. Uh, the middle class, in particular in, uh, in, in Greece, which has traditionally uh, avoided uh, taxes. Yes, the middle classes should pay their taxes. They're better off than uh, most of the people in this room. But uh, the, uh, the other people who should pay taxes are banks. And it would be very, very simple to introduce uh, one, one proposal has been the financial transactions tax. I'm agnostic on this, but one tax which would be extremely effective, it seems to me, is a tax on bank balance sheets. Why would this be very effective? Because it would be very easy to tax bank balance sheets at a time when the central bank is making banks very liquid. They have the liquidity, they could pay that tax. Uh, and the clever thing to do would be to uh, impose a tax, let's say, of 1 or 
on bank balance sheets and then use the money from that tax to buy in the government bonds from the banks <coughs> at that uh, By, so buying the, the government bonds at their full price, what effect would this have? Well, it would give every bank an incentive to hold government bonds. Because if they held government bonds, they would then get their liquidity back. You would pay their taxes, they would pay the liquidity to the government, and they would then get that liquidity back. Uh, if they, as they got their, their liquidity back, so their liquidity position would stay the same, but the government debt would be cancelled. Because and over a period of time, you could eliminate the government debt in this way. Uh, <coughs> the more complex, the most complex version of this procedure uh, was one which appeared in the art, uh, which was put, I put forward in Italy, and that is that uh, you, you combine the twist with this, so you, uh, the, the government uh, introduces short, uh, issues short term securities, uses them to buy back long term securities, and then uh, after it's bought back the long-term securities, it imposes a tax on the banks, uh, on bank balance sheets, and uses the proceeds of the tax to pay back um, the short-term borrowing. I mean, they, these are these are you know financial operations. More of them need to uh, uh, need to happen. They are not the solution but they stabilize the markets. The actual solution is somewhere else. And the actual solution lies in raising wages. This is uh, the uh, ultimate, the most effective way of uh, reflating the economy it's the most effective way because if you raise wages, this money goes. Uh, this money is likely to be spent. In particular, if you raise the wages at the bottom, that can be done quite simply by raising the minimum uh, wage. Uh, it's a uh, it's a difficult thing to do in countries where you don't where you have decentralised wage bargaining. Uh, you could do it in Germany. However, I'm very much opposed to the proposals that have been made uh, else, uh, by, elsewhere by uh, some proponents of internal devaluation. There are um, uh, uh, people who argue that you should raise German wages and uh, that and reduce wages in the periphery in Southern Europe. Uh, this is the wrong way to look at it. It's the wrong way to look at it because if you look at the interaction between uh, the, the wage changes and uh, the debt system, uh, what that does is it actually, this actually reduces the real value of debt in Germany and increases the real value of debt in, in southern Europe or in the periphery, you actually need a, an increase in wages throughout the European Union. And I believe that this is what the, uh, the, the, the left should be fighting for. Uh, I accept that this is utopian. This is not... Uh, the, the capitalists will, of course, scream that they're going to be ruined uh, by, by this, as they always do, because they never realise that when wages go up, 
that's also creating a market for, uh, for their output. Uh, they will scream about it, um, but in a sense it shows one of the paradoxes, it illustrates one of the paradoxes of contemporary capitalism, that the only way out of this kind of uh, deflation is precisely the kind of strategy uh, which the capitalists will resist, and which I think the left has to fight for uh, and should be fighting for, along with the trade union movement uh, and the social movement. Thank you very much. Now time for the debate. Comments? Okay, Tony. Just a small comment at the end. Would you agree you said that capitalists do not understand the nature of aggregate demand? That they yeah. Uh, would you agree that they actually do understand, but they want to, that they don't want themselves to pay, they want always the other capitalists to pay, <laughs> so there is no capitalist solidarity per se. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's true, yes. Yeah, so the, so the, the, um, they want someone else to pay, but it, um, it's uh, that and it's part of the philistinism of, of capitalism that someone who's made money out of business is believed to have a, 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 a more profound insight uh, into the workings of capitalism than someone who uh, actually works, uh, uh, you know, works for that capitalist. Uh, Anina Kaltenbrunner has in the morning framed the, the current crisis, at least its uh, uh, European dimension, as a balance uh, payment crisis. Do you agree with this uh, view? And also, if you do, uh, how does your proposal uh, uh, solve this in, internal imbalance uh, inside of the uh, European uh, Union or um, Eurozone? Oh, you, you, you mean the problem that the, uh, Germany has a trade surplus and greed? Uh, yeah. uh, and and the yeah, I I don't see why why this should be a pro if you have a properly functioning credit system, like in other words, a credit system which is not destroyed by um, uh, obsessions about government debt, then this shouldn't matter. Uh, you don't um, the uh, trade imbalances between. Um, Southern and Northern Europe are uh, settled through, um, uh, through through the credit system. If we had, I think this is where uh, you know I can see this this sort of behind it the uh, an, an idea of the, the commodity um, commodity ideas of money or uh, the, or fiat money. In other words, you, that you can only get money through trade or fiscal um, or, or some kind of fiscal redistribution. You don't necessarily need to do that. All you need to, need to do is to have uh, 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 proper um, uh, credit tr uh, transfers. I I don't see it as being a problem, except and unless you have an 18th century type of monetary system where you're using gold and gold is an imported commodity so you need to have a to, to acquire gold you need to export and to um uh, yeah I, I don't think it's a problem uh, yes i think there would be another problem with uh, a proposal like yours to raise wages in, ge in general in the european union i think that the purchasing power of uh, even the, the lower classes of peri peripheral uh, European states would buy uh, products manufactured in the, in the core countries. So it would not uh, widen the domestic markets of the peri peripheral states and it would not boost their economy. Uh, so. But what, you know, I don't, I really, yes, there is a problem of the this is a problem of the, uh, the unequal distribution of capital uh, around, I mean, productive capital uh, around uh, the, the European Union. 
I still don't see why uh, it should be uh, a problem uh, because if you uh, you, you you buy um, you know people in the in the in the periphery buy German cars and uh, German car workers go on holiday in, in 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 the south because you know you have better weather here than they have there. Uh, they it's not a um, it, 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 you, you don't necessarily need to have uh, an equal distribution of manufacturing production. You need some, but not. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be equally spread around. Although it does look, you know, if you, if, if you look at these, uh, 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 you know, the trade figures. It looks bad, but that's only because you look at the trade figures. If we didn't look at the trade figures, would it be a problem? <laughs> well, it would be a problem because, uh, for instance, Slovenian, look, the wage bundle of a Slovenian worker is composed of, I've, this is of course an estimation, for, for, for instance, about 75% of uh, the products come from other countries some of them even not European. So um, the more you raise up the level of the consumption, the more uh, the, the, the part, uh, the share of uh, the products that are actually uh, pro produced here grows. So, uh, but this is not the problem. The, pro the main problem is that uh, if you raise these wages, the purchasing power will still go out and it will not have to raise a demand for the local manufacturers or service providers to, to increase their production, increase uh, wages, increase uh, productivity, increase their, uh, increase their uh, supply and uh, employment, of course, in the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, but, uh, but this is where the distribution of income is very important. In particular, the, the distribution of income vis-a-vis -vis the middle class. The um, the real um, uh, issue is uh, uh, the the real problem with, uh, in in this part of Europe is that the um, following the uh, you know over the last twenty years there has been uh, the big boom has been the big expansion has been among the middle classes the middle classes have expanded and their consumption. Uh, has expanded. The industrial working class has declined in, in numerically. Uh, possibly, uh, I'm, and I'm not sure about production. Uh, I suspect, uh, uh, but in, in some cases, also uh, in, in terms of production. Now, if you, um, uh, I, if you raise wages, my my view is that you you should uh, raise wages as opposed to expanding the consumption of the middle class because it's the consumption of that middle class which is particularly import intensive. At the bottom, uh, most people uh, on, on the lowest earnings spend money on locally produced food, locally produced, uh, possibly locally produced clothes, but certainly locally produced food, and, uh, uh, but also locally produced housing services. You know housing and, uh, and the, the, this kind of thing. So in that sense, it's, it, it's, uh, it's staying there. And uh, I, you know, this is, uh, uh, I think that this is a, a, a proper a kind of class, um, a, a class approach to take. But you, um, otherwise, you're, um, uh, I still, th you know, a lot of the discussion I think has, has underestimated the degree to which the the, the present the, the capitalist prosperity of re uh, of recent years has depended on the growth of that middle class. It's not necessarily been a very dynamic capitalism that we had in Europe. It's the growth of the middle class, uh, and that's what needs to be adjusted. <coughs>